All right, so instead, we're going to be talking about uh, point of care ultrasound of the eye. Uh, hopefully, we'll go relatively uh, quickly uh, through this, and uh, yeah, it should be fun. And maybe this is going to, all right, good. Okay, so first, no, no conflict of interest, no industry, nothing like that, but then also, just, uh, just so you guys know, I basically just trolled the internet looking for a bunch of pictures, um, so don't uh, take all my pictures and then charge people for your lecture. Um, I was in no danger of that here, obviously, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, fair use and all that good stuff. Okay, so what are the objectives of the talk? the obligatory objectives of the talk slide. First, just to try to influence you to think that maybe point of care ultrasound of the eyeball is useful and relevant to your life. Um, but also uh, to review some of the anatomy, to uh, talk a about the ultrasonographic anatomy, uh, to describe how to do this, and to talk about indications for and uh, different pathologies for the uh, uh, ocular pocus. And then obviously to have eye puns, so we're starting off with the uh, bullseye. We had the eye of Saron earlier. I don't know, Hobbit fans, okay. And then uh, for five points, does anyone know what this is? Eye of Horus. Horus, the eye of Horus, very good. Five points. Uh, five points. <laughs> no points to Gryffindor, goodbye. Uh, okay, so why should you care? Well, uh, it's, um, it's relatively common to have an intraocular injury. If you think about it, anything that's good enough to break a bone is good enough to sort of break a squishy bit. Same way you think about rib fractures and spleens, think about the eye as sort of the spleen of the face. So, um, you have to be careful about injuries, uh, sorry, to that specifically. Um, traditional exam sometimes not useful if their uh, eye is all swollen shut. Uh, you have to sort of get around it. And maybe the best thing to do is not to start digging in there with a paper clip um, and just prying the eye open like you see. I don't know. You know. As long as it's one of those rubber coated paper clips, I'm sure it's fine. Um, and the other reason is uh, well, you never did learn the slit lamp or the fundoscope, so at least you know how to do something to make you look like, uh, uh, like you know what you're doing. So, you know, all of these guys here, sure, the outside looks good, and sometimes the outside is, uh, is or the inside is on the outside, but you have to worry about uh, injury, especially some of these pictures to, the, uh, to this green left house right. Um, you're concerned about structure, uh, underlying structure injury. A lot of the pictures that I'll be talking, uh, uh, showing you guys are from uh, the Eye Emergency Manual, which is out of New South Wales. Just had, I happen to have this book, and it happened to have some good pictures in it. And then also Sound Bites. There's a great lecture if you guys want to sort of supplement your ultrasound uh, training. I enjoy the cmedownloads.com Sound Bites series. It's free. Uh, he goes over, uh, it's uh, Phil Pereira, he goes over extensive, exhaustive, annoying detail for all of your exams, so all of your questions will be answered, and they're uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good comprehensive lectures. Okay, so the external eye anatomy. Um, medial is sort of uh, closer toward me, medial canthus, uh, uh, and then that lacrimal sac there with those uh, two ducts, the caniculi. Um, just remember that when you are dealing with ocular trauma, that medial area is something that uh, you can get or, uh, Opto to be very excited about because those are ducts and they have to be sort of stented open if they're going to heal. Otherwise, if there's a transection, there's a high likelihood that they're going to heal, but they're going to heal shut. You have some problems with tearing and inability to drain your eye um, in the future. That actually happened to my older brother. He was bit in the face by a dog and then they didn't get his tear duct fixed and he couldn't be a pilot because he was always tearing out of his eye. Isn't that sad? Yes. So now you will consult Opto and recognize that, again, underlying structure even there. Uh, limbus is the area where the cornea meets the sclera, okay? So there's that limbus sparing versus non-limbus sparing erythema. Um, that's uh, just sort of the relationship between the cornea and the, and the rest of the sclera. Uh, and then the lacrimal gland is up top. The bony anatomy, uh, again, medial is uh, toward me, obviously. Um, this is just to uh, recall, especially when you're thinking about your orbital floor fractures, like what is actually being fractured. So you're fracturing, you know, uh, down, does this work? Yeah. So you're actually sort of fracturing through here, and you can look and just appreciate how thin these bones are, you know, uh, into the ethmoid, uh, sinus, the lacrimal bone, all these sorts of uh, ideas here. And then your uh, uh, palpable landmarks for your nerve injections are your inferior and superior supra, supra uh, sorry, supraorbital and infraorbital notches where your nerves come out. 
And then finally, uh, we're going to get to the globe. This is the uh, internal anatomy. This is an axial cut, so it's cut looking down. That's why up top is nasal and down uh, south is temporal. Now, I could have just lied to you and said this is also a cut longitudinally, and so, you know, because it's essentially the same, which is why the uh, anatomy of the eye from a sonographic point of view isn't too difficult. Um, but the reason I wanted to point this out specifically, and we'll get to it, and some of you who've played the home game know why we're going to get to it, is temporal is here where the optic disc and optic nerve are. And then remember, nasal is sort of where you're looking for your fovea, your macula, and that'll uh, play a part in terms of your MAC on or your MAC off retinal detachments. Okay, so when you go in with your fundoscope, <laughs> no, so when you go in and do your fundoscopy, remember you're looking for the optic nerve, and then you're sort of headed this way to look for that cherry red spot for, uh, you know, your central artery and, and, and so on. The macula is going to be uh, nasal and the uh, optic uh, nerve is going to be <coughs> lateral temporal. Cool. So this is the norm, normal sonoanatomy. Essentially we're dealing with here sort of uh, your, your lid, your uh, cornea here, your anterior chamber. Here's sort of your gel and we'll talk about the gel pillow and what you need to do there iris, and here's the posterior aspect of your crystalline lens, and normally you only see that posterior aspect of the lens. So uh, here the lens actually comes up, rides along the iris here, and is essentially uh, shaped like that. Um, and so your iris, you can actually look and get a sense of your pupil diameter here if you've got a full, if you've got a true sort of a, a axial cut. Vitreous humor, posterior eye, Retina is usually not visible, just laid down, tacked on along the back of the eye. And then your optic nerve sheath is here. And optic nerve sheath is a, sort of the proper way to think about this because what we're actually seeing on ultrasound isn't the optic nerve itself um, because the nerve travels within a sheath that's got some fat in it and uh, importantly got some CSF in it. And so we'll find that useful here in just a second. Okay, and then there's very specifically the anterior chamber is what we, I just talked about, uh, cornea, Again, iris, you can see it's sort of the connection or sort of the change from iris to, to lens. Lens sort of continues, and your ciliary bodies and zonules and all that fun stuff here. Okay, the eye pun, anyone? Or at least the eye oriented situation? Eye yeah, this is the eye of the hurricane. Does anyone know which hurricane in particular? Sandra. Katrina. <laughs> so for the geography majors out there, this is Sandy. Um, yeah, so Katrina, Louisiana, which is where we are not right now, oriented times. Okay, so so yeah, so this just happens to be Hurricane Katrina, but the eye of the, uh, eye of the storm, fair enough. So how do I do this? What do I need? The first thing you need is a, a high frequency transducer, and those are going to be your linear transducers. They have a small one and a big one. The big one you sort of use for DVTs and central lines. The small one you might use for tendons, uh, ABGs, eyeballs, that sort of stuff. Um, and you want to try to see if, if at all possible an ophthalmic one of the transducers that has an ophthalmic or an orbital setting, because there is a difference in terms of the power output. Now almost all of the ultrasound machines that you have, um, including the ones here, have sort of factory um, uh, out, uh, standardized outputs that are well below the thermal index or sort of the, the amount of power that we start to get significant or at least appreciable tissue heat. Um, you want to be careful about that in terms of certain sensitive tissues including you know, baby heart rate, uh, that kind of stuff, but in particular the retina as well because it's, it's established that the amount of energy required to make a temperature change in the retina is actually much less than the amount of uh, energy required to make a temperature change at the bone soft tissue interface for your fetus. So just uh, try to make sure there's an orbital setting and you don't sit there and sort of scan all day, right? It's like any other radiologic study, it's, this is the safest radiologic study you probably have to offer a patient, but there's still this alara, you don't want to just sort of overexpose someone just for, for funsies, right? Which is why ACOG is actually against the 3D smushy baby face thing, like for no good reason. So they're just like, yeah, for, uh, you know, for glamour shots of your, of your fetus, maybe there's no need to do a 3D ultrasound if there's really no need to do a 3D ultrasound. You know, if it's indicated, sure, but why are you doing it otherwise? Um, so, fair enough, you need one of those. You need a comfortable patient, so positioning is important. Lots of gel or sterile lubricant to create a, a little bit of a gel pillow or a standoff pad, which are commercially available, but I don't think I've ever used one. 
Um, and then you'll need uh, lacquer lube, artificial tears, bacitrates and ophthalmic, something to actually put on the lashes of the eye, uh, tegaderm, and then cleaning wipes. So <clears throat> this is uh, someone who's just really super into this gel pillow. Um, <laughs> it's apparently a very relaxing thing, but the thing that sort of gives me angina looking at this is there's no tegaderm covering his eye, right? So we just saw from our last presentation, mine, not the stroke one, uh, that sometimes the machine probes get bloody. What? And so who do you use these things on? You use these things on people who have hepatitis, IVDA, difficult vein access. So now I'm just gonna plop that transducer onto someone's eyeball, not my eyeball. So uh, you put, the first thing you do is you put down a tegaderm and you can sort of have the patient give you sort of like the surprise kind of look and sort of mascara kind of thing. Um, uh, not that I ever read in the magazine. <laughs> so uh, you, put the, uh, you have their eyes wide, you put the teggy on here, and you sort of go through the superior part of the, uh, of the uh, lid. Um, you can also, uh, if people have beautiful eyelashes and they want to keep them, uh, then you can put some lacquer lube, bastrace, and ophthalmic, or any of that sort of stuff underneath, and then put the tegaderm on so that when you're pulling off, you're not pulling off all the eyelashes as well. So you do that, throw the teggy on there, and then you just sort of make your uh, soft serve. <laughs> mound of gel on top of that. And then so here, this is uh, your pinky out ultrasonography, like uh, if you uh, play pool. Uh, whenever you hold your ultrasound, or whatever this is, uh, then you have your hand and your, uh, all the pressure in your hand uh, onto the bone, and you can sort of gently have as little pressure as you can on the ult with the ultrasound transducer itself. So my hand from pinky to sort of wrist is over here on the forehead or on the nasal bone or on the maxilla or wherever, and I'm just sort of uh, not putting too much pressure on here. Okay. That'll keep you from sliding. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, and it'll also uh, uh, make sure you don't put too much pressure. And you do it in transverse and long axis. Uh, so pinky out, try to sort of stabilize your hand. Um, transverse, you sort of will sweep through. You want to orient your probe marker laterally. Um, and you're sort of sweeping through top to bottom. And it's not, as you guys saw, particularly difficult anatomy. It's a big blob of fluid that transmits ultrasound. You're not dealing with bones, you're not dealing with air levels, or are you? Um, so none of that stuff. Uh, you'll sweep through one view, uh, one, I'm sorry, orientation. The second orientation, you'll get your optic nerve sheath diameter measurements, um, and then you'll also uh, obtain a clip of the patient looking right and looking left in transverse view or in long axis view, looking up and looking down. Um, and the reason you're doing that is called the kinetic exam, and we'll see why that's important later. Maybe not today. All right. Okay, they're supposed to start automatically, but can't have everything where would you put it. So this is just uh, an example of the kinetic exam. Uh, you'll see that I don't have enough gel here. I probably could use a little bit more gel just so I've backed away a little bit. Uh, you'll see that the anterior chamber is just slightly in view at sort of the beginning. There, and then it goes away as he looks to one side. Here, sort of this posterior area here, you'll see that this is super overgained, right? And so you'll remember from physics, this is posterior enhancement, but also the gain is way up. And the reason the gain is way up is because I was looking sort of in here for some of this vitreous debris that comes sliding into view like through there, just kind of looking for a little bit of that. But even with this gain all the way up, I can still see that sort of my optic nerve is in there, and as he turns around, it goes this way. So I'm just looking for things moving around here on my kinetic exam. Okay, we'll see some more examples of that. Later. Yeah. Okay, so when do I do this at all, right? Well, uh, it's kind of like the FAST exam. There's a role and a time when it comes in to make sense. Um, and for me, it's here, right? So if I'm not going to do direct ophthalmoscopy or I have trouble with it, then uh, and I'm concerned about a condition um, that we'll talk about, then that's sort of where my point of care ultrasound, uh, which is what POCUS stands for. It's not just magic. It's also an acronym. Um, so that's where I would put it. And I would also sort of put it there. That's right. I would also sort of put it there um, as sort of a pre-test uh, before I might do any other additional tests, and we'll get into the orbital x-rays and why those might or might not be useful. But that's kind of where it goes. You want your visual acuity, you want to sort of obviously do your stabilization, your history, find out what you think might be going on. Um, you want to look at the pupils if you can, and if you can't, you can use ultrasound. Um, and then you want to sort of do your, uh, your exam at that time. 
So these are some of the various conditions that uh, point of care ultrasound might be indicated for, and we'll get into uh, each of them as we go along. Okay, so someone comes in and they say, you know, I've got blurry vision. Well, that's what everyone's got. I don't care if it's because your sugar's 500 and your lens has no fluid in it, so it can't, you know, uh, focus. Uh, or uh, you're having a migraine or you're having a stroke. It's always blurry vision. All right, fair enough. So you have to try to drill down on that if at all possible. But certainly a blurry or wavy visual loss, like you might see represented on this little street scene here, you know, can't see anything on that side, or a curtain that comes down that is not... Uh, fugax, you know, that doesn't go away. Um, those things are sort of concerning for retinal detachment as well as floaters, photopsia, all the stuff that you uh, that you remember from um, from reading about them. And why does that happen? Well, it happens because uh, uh, that's as the retina sort of starts to die. The retina is uh, opposed to the choroid, and in the same way that uh, you can get the skin to sort of get a blood supply from up above, you can sort of replace it or get a skin graft, the retina is getting its blood uh, supply essentially directly from the choroid. So as the fluid comes in between choroid and dissects the retina off, this area of the retina is just no longer getting blood supply, blood supply and that'll sort of start to die, which is sort of one of the reasons that um, there's a time uh, issue with getting your retinal detachment. Uh, taken care of. Okay, so it might look something like this, because of course if it's on the left side of my world, it's on the right side of my eye, right? Okay. Great. Uh, a lot of the stuff I just said apparently, normal retina is continuous with the posterior elements, um, and usually you don't see it, but in detachment, uh, fluid will come in and will sort of dissect that guy off. Same thing, you can actually get fluid in between the retina and the vitreous as well to dissect the vitreous off, but that's uh, less important. That can sometimes be, uh, be fixed better. The retina is uh, what we call tethered, um, so it's attached in the same way that you get a subdural or an epidural, and the epidural will sort of look like a lens because it's, it can't go further than its uh, confines. That's sort of why you get the convexity. It's sort of demarcated by do you guys know what in the skull, like where that demarcation happens? Suture. Yeah, at the suture lines, right? So where you have your skull, that's where your dura mater is connected at the suture lines. So that's why you get this one pocket boom, with blood, and so that pocket fills. So that's why you get that lentiform shape, the epidural. In the same way, the retina is attached at the aura serrata here, which sort of goes all the way around, and then down here at the optic nerve. So essentially, if you think of like an old-timey Henry V uh, goblet, and then you put just a felt sort of cup inside that goblet, any fluid that gets in between that felt cup and the goblet itself is going to be that retinal detachment, okay? And it's sort of tethered here and tethered there. So this is, uh, is this working? Yes. Okay, so this is sort of what it looks like. Usually we're concerned about traumatic. You can get exudative or tractor retinal detachments as well. I mean, you don't always e uh, easily see it. Uh, you know, uh, I used to carry on a panoptic just because I kind of uh, nerded out about this, but um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to do, especially in the ER sometimes. So uh, the other thing that's interesting is if you're in trauma, you can imagine a situation where vitreous hemorrhage or other debris sort of here might obscure your ability to see what's going on in the back of the eye as you're looking through. So uh, you might be able to look through some of that stuff and see the retina in the back side. Um, the retina is going to be hyperechoic or bright. It's going to be undulating, sort of like this wavy thing. I think of it, if you remember in uh, grade school at gym class, everyone sort of stood around a big parachute and you had like everyone took the parachute and you sort of shook it like this and you sometimes put balls in the middle of the parachute. It's public school in West Virginia. I can see it from some of you now. Okay, so uh, so that's sort of a, that was Jim. Uh, so anyway, that's the kind of thing is you're looking along the edge of that parachute where things are sort of waving like this. Okay, um, and you're tethered as we mentioned. So here's another sort of rougher uh, picture. This is usually the quality of stuff that you may end up getting, right? So this guy here, this guy snaking along through here. Now, uh, I just mentioned it about this cup goblet tethering situation. So, how do you feel that a retinal detachment will behave around the optic nerve? So, uh, I'll, 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 I'll use the word it'll respect it. And we can actually see this here where I'm tethered sort of uh, up top. And then I'm also tethered down toward the bottom. And you can see sort of how that retinal, like, 
whoop, oh, that's where my optic nerve is, right? So you can almost get sort of this like V, you know, uh, 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 all the detached retinas and V formation uh, kind of through here. I'm wondering, okay. Uh, but that's sort of what you're looking at. You're sort of tethered here and through there. So if you see a line in the eye uh, and it doesn't respect that optic nerve, then potentially that's more of your vitreous detachment as opposed to a retinal detachment, yeah? All right, cool. Okay. Anyone? Yes, maybe? I Ching. I Ching, very good. Uh, yeah, uh, which dynasty manuscript is that? Okay. <laughs> Song dynasty, it's okay. Uh, no, two points. Okay, so let's say there's something else going on back there, right? Okay, so here in this picture, I've uh, mentioned that the, the uh, retina looks like a line. It looks hyper-echoic. Right? And it sort of will uh, be tethered in the back. So here, I've got actually two things going on. Right? So here's something. It's like, oh, there's my, my retina through there. But actually, no, that's my retina. Sort of, um, and so that's sort of the, that subtle of a difference. I don't know if it comes through in the light. But so you see that the, the stuff that's sort of in the middle of the vitreous is just a little less echogenic less bright and uh, the one that's in the back is that retina detachment and it's just a little bit brighter so this is it's kind of a subtle difference but again the things that you're looking for uh, are the ones I mentioned in terms of its tethering points how it behaves on kinetic exam and quite honestly what you're going to be doing is calling up the ophthalmologist and says you can't see he's got something in his eye mm -hmm. like it's a, you know and that's probably enough right like you can say you can make it sound good by saying, "Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a vitreous detachment or a retinal detachment, but he's got you know." You describe the visual acuity, you do the things that you would do for a consult, but this makes it sound very exciting, right? It's like, Ooh, I'll come right down. Like, I want to see that. You know. So fair enough. And this is actually uh, what we're seeing here. This is uh, obviously not my picture, but this is uh, a vitreous hemorrhage in addition to a retinal detachment. Okay, so just take another look at that. And it's the same eye, it's just two different pictures. What's also fun about this particular picture here, if I can do it, where's my arrow? What's also fun about this picture here, is just through here, that's my bubble level. So that's just sort of the side of the bony orbit there. Okay, so just again, like any bone, that bright white with shadowing underneath it. Okay, so vitreous hemorrhage, what that's like. This is sort of uh, what it looks like, and you say, oh, every single one of my patients I've ever tried to do a fundoscopic <laughs> exam on must have a vitreous hemorrhage. Um, <laughs> not necessarily, uh, but it is something to, uh, to watch out for if you really can't get that good re red reflex or can't see that uh, optic nerve. Um, sudden, usually painless. Uh, again, floaters, dark spots, spots, flashes from traction, all that stuff kind of the same. Blurred vision and then you can't see the fundus. And this again, trauma is the one we care usually most about, but remember things like sickle cell um, and diabetes, uh, which causes retinal proliferation, all those things. Um, new uh, vessels are crummy vessels. So whether it's from diabetes or from cancer, that's why you're more likely to bleed, right? They just, it's like uh, skyscrapers. They put them up too quick and so they're crummy construction. Um, the other thing that's sort of fun about this, okay, so this is another picture. Here, you just happen to have like a little bit of that hyper-echoic clotted blood that's sitting there. And they call this uh, just sort of uh, uh, clothes in a washing machine, or things are just sort of at the laundromat tumbling one side to the other. So that tends to be more of a vitreous problem, whether it's blood or just vitreous debris, um, as opposed to that uh, retinal detachment, which is just sort of whip-like sitting there. And for fun, uh, uh, there is this thing called Tursen syndrome which is essentially vitreous hemorrhage associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and it's kind of like a little, oh yeah, how about that trivia point of view? But if you do have someone who's got a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, then you can always look in their eye and sort of see if you can see this, this retinal, uh, uh, or sorry, this vitreous hemorrhage as well. It's just kind of a, a fun physical finding for these folks. So here a little bit hyper, well, hyperechoic CT equivalent, and here sort of in the back. And then finally, posterior vitreous detachment. This is one I did during my fellowship that I was like, oh, sweet, retinal detachment, there it is. But if you look, um, and this is sort of eye of faith, it's not quite as 
echogenic or hyperechoic as a retinal detachment might be. And then uh, I don't think I have it here, because I think out through here is where my uh, optic nerve is going to be, but this uh, was later pointed out to me, oh, fellows, uh, later pointed out to me that it uh, sort of crossed that optic disc, right? So it didn't respect that optic nerve line. But if, Dr. Shannon, if you're not looking in the right plane, it may look like it's not respecting the optic nerve. Absolutely. Yeah, so you have to you have to make sure that you get them both in the same view, right? Because you can see uh, if, you know, if I'm sort of like this and here's my cup, and I'm sort of in like this plane, and I'll just see this ribbon here, and I won't even have the optic nerve, it's entirely possible. Or if I'm looking sort of at the plane of my made by my ring fingers, um, then I'll see this, but my optic nerve is just a little bit more toward me. And so I might sort of uh, develop a plane. So that's again why you have to scan through the entire object of interest in two different orthogonal planes. Okay. You can get a, if you want an ultrasound tattoo, that, that could be it. Okay. <laughs> See me after class. Uh, okay. So uh, this one here, what do you think is going on with the guy on the, uh, with this character here? Yeah, right? So this is a whole bunch of stuff. So we've got the washing machine of some hemorrhage and sort of vitreous material here, so some clothes and a dryer. But then we've also got a drying clothes line, which is your red, right? And you sort of go back and forth. And, you know, you just have to do this for an hour and a half so that every time they move the eye, it's just so the red that keeps tearing away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Irate, good job. <laughs> okay, hey doc, I got blurry vision. I got punched in the face probably because I treated someone the way I'm treating you right now. Um, yeah, blurry vision. Okay, so looks a little suspect, right? Okay, now look up toward the ceiling. Okay, well not only did you get incredibly pale, but <laughs> this guy looks like he's looking up, and this one not so much, right? So you've got uh, diplopia. Right on uh, on uh, gaze, and it's called double diplopia because if this guy, let's say my left is sort of fixed, whether I look up or down, this guy will sort of give me uh, no change. So I've got this sort of chameleon action going on, and so when you've got diplopia there, and you've got restricted extracted movements, what's one reason that might uh, give you this in someone who just punched in the face? Yeah, right, so a little blowout fracture, and what happens is you get herniation of fat, sure, who cares, but you get herniation of inferior rectus, and so now you just sort of can't lift up because your pulley is sort of trapped in place. And also, if this sinus is full of blood, potentially you can see that on bedside ultrasound, where you sort of will put your linear transducer just right here, and if you're able to see, like a fluid, uh, to see anything beyond that initial bone lo level, then you know that that sinus is full of blood instead of air, and so uh, you'll, you can make that diagnosis as well. Okay, apparently uh, uh, two dudes, uh, the bullet fairy, was visiting the ER because everyone's getting punched in the face by two dudes. Um, here's another, uh, blurry vision after trauma. Here's another one. Instead of being sunken in, this one is sort of puffed out towards you. I don't know if you can appreciate the difference there. So a little bit sunken in, a little bit pushed out. It's hard to tell, but basically this one's got exophthalmos. Here's sort of a larger extent. Um, and so this one, retrobulbar hematoma. Okay, so this is, enough, again, it's all about ischemia, right? As ER doctors, you got two jobs, diagnose infection and diagnose ischemia. The rest of it is detailed. So, um, so here, you've got an ischemic compartment syndrome of the eye. Okay, so you're interested in checking pressure, you're doing all that sort of stuff. Uh, you want to manage your intra increased intraocular pressure with the, all the things that you might do. Um, and you want to sort of get things going. Uh, early optical consult, or depending on where you practice, like go ahead and cut the, uh, the ligament and do lateral canthotomy just to try to relieve that pressure. 
because again, it's tough to sort of, I definitely have had patients who have got transferred for, for you know, intraocular pressures greater than you know, 40, and they're just like, yeah, so he's accepted to, to your ophthalmology service. I was like, great, sounds good, we'll see him in the trauma center. Are you gonna give him anything? I, like, uh, I thought about it, I'm just like, I can't tell you how to practice medicine, but go ahead and give him, you know, at least acetazolamide, give him some timolol, you know, if you're not comfortable, then, you know, at least start some of that stuff, okay? Here, instead of this fat behind, okay, I've got this nice sort of thing, they call it a guitar pig sign. Uh, I don't know what that means, uh, uh, but there's this sort of like that hypocoat fluid collection behind the eye. Here is just a couple videos uh, uh, that we took. This guy, it's, uh, you see it more at the beginning of the video where this sort of, sort of wedge-shaped character there exists. And then uh, this is actually the same person, just at a different angle. You have the optic nerve coming in on this side somewhere, but then a little bit of fluid over on that side. Okay. And again, this kinetic exam, it's obviously very dependent on uh, patient uh, uh, compliance. And you also, if you look on this one, maybe you can see that as they turn a little bit, there's some vitreous blood as well. A little swishy stuff there, right? So all sorts of things going on. And then this is just a CT showing that sort of, that uh, location of retrobulbar hematoma and this proptosis as a result, right? Okay, so this is just again, uh, this one is a little bit more subtle, I think. I'd have a tough time with this, but just sort of trying to sort of make that guy there. And the other one is a normal exam that's not as overgained. So this is, again, uh, in terms of the tool, know how to use it. So if you don't see anything, you can play with your gain settings, play with your depth settings until you get the picture you need. There's no, um, there's no evidence, like, like I'm not just such a rare diagnosis, and nobody yeah. knows how good an ultrasound is for this. So I've been, in I've been in a situation where we I was a very well-trained ultrasound person with a retrobulbar and we couldn't find it. I was just cautioned, clinical exam, you know, yeah. measuring intraocular pressure, do the lateral chemotomy. It's a mobile polish to tell you that it's not cosmetically that big of a deal. It's, it's almost, you know, well, so just, it's very cool if you find it, but I wouldn't base your treatment. Right, yeah, like this, the, the test characteristics for this, as you could, as I point out, you have to have a series of patients before you can get test characteristics, and we'll come into, we'll revisit this question when we start talking about optic nerve sheath diameter in terms of, well, what's positive and negative, and, and kind of like compartment syndrome, when there is a striker, and years ago I put a little, like, how to use a striker and where the compartments are in the box. I don't know if it's still there. Actually, okay, I'm gonna go check to see if it's still there. Uh, but, you know, if you can't figure out the striker, you're not sure about the pressures, the, uh, you know, it, the onus is on you to say, look, this is clinically suspected and we need to sort of move forward with it. And the same thing is true of the lateral canthotomy. Uh, you know, um, like I say, it's kind of a cool diagnosis and man, if it's there, you feel much better about, okay, now I'm gonna do a lateral canthotomy, I guess. Okay, so, uh, so again, in your scope of practice, but you would feel better about doing it, I don't know, at least I would if I knew, like, okay, yeah, that's there, the pressure's there, it's consistent, I'm not crazy, let's, let's go. Okay? The Eye of the Tiger. Which Rocky? Rocky three, because that's Mr. T. Oh, I love it. Outstanding. That's what the Eye of the Tiger looks like, in case you're wondering. Okay, um, next uh, case, uh, someone comes in. Um, and like most of your patients, they were uh, on their yacht, they popped open some champagne, <laughs> they got hit in the eye, it's very sad. Um, they've got an equestrian appointment coming up, so you have to, or maybe this happened, or maybe that happened, right? So uh, maybe that's more your patient population. So trauma to the eye, the, that other one is obviously penetrating, not blunt. If that were blunt trauma, man, that's interesting. So physical exam, uh, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's not so subtle. Um, here, right, you've got just extruded uveal tissue, extruded iris. It's like, hey, what color is your eye? Okay, I didn't want to know that bad. Okay. Um, but then almost, uh, this uveal tissue is almost always brown, after that's kind of a joke. It's almost always brown regardless of the color of the eye. It's like a little bit of the iris pigment, but it's usually what comes out here is sort of kind of the other side. And then the other thing you'll get for a penetrating injury see this irregular pupil, they'll sort of point toward the area of injury. So, like, you're suspicious that your foreign body entered there, essentially. 
And then when you see people post cataract surgery, you can have surgical pupils. And you have to be careful. It's kind of like the urine is dirty. Well, do you mean that this urine is contaminated and I can't trust it? Or do you mean that this person has a UTI? In the same way, oh, the patient has a surgical pupil. Because there is a meaning of surgical pupil, which means they've got a blown pupil and they need neurosurgery, as opposed to the patient is post-op from a cataract surgery, and so I can't evaluate the pupil. Okay, so, so there's a, 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 a call to be clear when you're talking about some of, the, some of this stuff. So um, when I sort of see this on my POCUS uh, exam, what do you think I got here? Extremes of my globe, where are the margins, where's the borders? Oh, well, maybe there isn't one, right? So this is a ruptured globe, but what I like about this picture is that's where sort of my cornea is, that's my eyelid, and then look how much gel is here, right? So the person who did this obviously was worried about an open globe and just put a ton of gel uh, on top. I'm going to pretend that that's my tegaderm right on top there. Um, put a whole bunch of gel on top so that there was no way they were going to sort of accidentally squish in, right, and put a lot of pressure on the eye. So that's the one thing you don't want to do. So uh, just a whole bunch of soft serve and you should be good. Uh, ruptured globe, again here, this sort of thing, you lose this sort of structure and it sort of deflates. Here's a sort of a lateral view of that same, this is all that same patient. Um, and then um, you want the patient MPO, you want them transferred to an eye trauma center if you're not one, you give them antibiotics make sure they get life-saving tetanus, um, keep them from vomiting or doing anything to increase intracranial pressure, and uh, get them out. Dr. Shan? Yo. So if, if you have a really, really high suspicion for a globe rupture, would ultrasound be contraindicated? So uh, uh, if you basically, if it's not going to add anything, then yeah, I would say it would be contraindicated for that reason. It's like, you know, it's clearly ruptured and there's sort of uveal tissue and all that sort of stuff then yeah, I probably wouldn't do an ultrasound. But the, the role of ultrasound in this case, uh, and I think we'll get it when we get to pupils in particular, is let's say that there's overlying soft tissue trauma and edema to the point that goes back to this thing. Well, let's just open this eye and see what we can. Let's just get this eye open here. Right, until all of a sudden I'm, I'm well into the back of the skull, whoops. Right, so, uh, so that's sort of the role that I would have for, for ultrasound in that particular patient. And then you can always get a CT, and potentially you're gonna get a CT for bony structures and foreign bodies and all that sort of stuff. But certainly, if you sort of know kind of off the bat, not only is this thing swollen shut, but the globe is just deflated, okay, come in from home now, because I've got like six other traumas waiting for CT, and you can sort of move things along. A lot of it will depend on sort of what your resources are. And that's what ultrasound is good for. The reason it migrated to the hands of the ED physician is that the needs weren't being met, uh, being met otherwise. Or at least I guess that's my opinion as opposed to anything else. Okay, so like I said, uh, shield the eye, minimize manipulation. So again, if you don't need to do a sono, don't do a sono. Eye injuries can be tricky. So there's sort of an external eye hook, a fish hook, and there's sort of a fish hook sort of through there. So you have to be a little bit careful. Sometimes it's obvious, and sometimes it's less obvious, and you just have like a little exclamation point to guide you. Okay, and then also sort of a little bit of a tangent from the ultrasound, but if you've never heard of this or seen it done or done it yourself, just uh, remember the modified Seidel test uh, is uh, one where you just sort of use the fluorescein, you just give a broad uh, uh, painting of the eye, uh, either with the strip if you've got them tetracaned, or you can put some drops or the strip into a, a syringe and use that. And you're basically looking for this from deep to forward waterfall of fluid of, in this case, aqueous humor, that's just sort of coming out and clearing out that fluorescein that you just put in. So basically this dot here is a spigot and the humor is coming out and just sort of rinsing that away. Okay, so that's sort of your waterfall sign on your modified side does if you've not seen it. Over here on the side are other uh, things to look for that should raise your suspicion for a ruptured globe, like severe hemorrhage that covers you know, uh, most of the eye. Um, and then uh, your anterior chamber being uh, deflated compared to the other. Uh, significant hyphema and then that irregular pupil and all that. 
So again, ruptured globe on ultrasound, you might find some buckling of the sclera like you see in sort of this posterior one here. And this is one where the front of the eye doesn't look terrible, but you've got sort of like this rupture toward the back of the eye. Uh, and you don't have as much hemorrhage within the eye itself. And then the one on the right, obviously you just totally lose, uh, you know, whatever uh, semblance of eye structure, like probably that's your cornea. Uh, and again, nice uh, pillow there. Okay, so, uh, I don't know, I guess this is, a, but uh, regardless, on this one, you guys see any problems with uh, the eye on this side? Yeah, a little squishy cornea. So this is a, a nice uh, anterior uh, um, chamber uh, decompression. You can get it traumatically. This one uh, that's on the screen happened to steal from someone who had a corneal ulcer that just eroded through and just you know, excreted all of your uh, contents. And then remember also when you're dealing with some of these injuries, like a foreign body, um, like anything else, like a needle on your ultrasound is going to give you a bright thing, a little bit of ring down artifact, and you'll be able to see a bunch of things in the eye because it's essentially a water bath in and of itself, and it's sort of perfect to look for uh, some of these foreign bodies. Um, Open globe is a problem because you can lose the eye uh, with infection, all that sort of stuff, even with uh, good surgical repair. And the presence of foreign body complicates about 30% of your open globes. Again, here's one that's sort of more posterior, like that hypercoke foreign body in the eye. And then what's interesting is, uh, you know, uh, it used to be uh, plain films uh, were gotten quite a bit, and I guess they still could depending on your history, like if you've got a very clear history of metal grinding or something like that, you know, I suppose you could just get plain films. But there's really uh, no uh, need for that, uh, or uh, less of a role for that, depending on what your resources are. Um, and I think CT is kind of more the standard of care. Um, you can imagine what the problem with plain films are, where ultrasound really outperforms, is some of your organic tissue that's not going to show up on your plain film as well as this uh, piece of metal there. Okay. Anyone? I can. I <laughs> yes, I was going to get you at Randall's Island, but it is in fact ICANN Stadium. So that's how you should feel about ocular ultrasound. Yes, I can. Okay, so patient presentation, blunt trauma, double vision. Okay, here's your eye. And here, you know, is your lens that's sort of displaced and just kind of peeking in like this. So this happens to be a, a cataract lens that's just sort of been displaced and is now sort of off to the side. And you can imagine a situation where a person comes in and they see that there's double vision because remember you've got two sort of things that contribute to your focus, your lens, but mostly it's your cornea. Your lens is kind of your small knob on your microscope, your cornea is your big knob. So um, when your lens sort of comes out, kind of falls off at an angle, all of a sudden you're seeing kind of two reflections in your retina. Um, and so that is sort of uh, one of the things when someone says they have double vision, one of the first things you can ask them, and particularly in some of your psychiatric patients, is, okay, close your right eye. All right, do you still have double vision? Yes. Okay. If they don't have a lens dislocation, then it's psychiatric. There's almost nothing that can give you monocular double vision other than kind of like a lens dislocation and, and kind of lying to me. Uh, so uh, if, the, if it's still there with one eye, then you know you're just like, all right, I've got some time to work this up. Okay. And here, uh, on ultrasound, what does it look like? It looks like the lens, the crystalline lens, instead of sort of being up here, kind of like that, just sort of flows down and sits in the vitreous. This one I kind of like because it also just fills the vitreous with a bunch of blood. And here's sort of your crystalline lens that's just sort of out of place compared to here with your iris across there. Um, uh, it's going to dislocate posteriorly into the vitreous much more often than anteriorly. Um, and usually it's like post-replacement, right? So these are uh, artificial lenses after cataract surgery that have come loose and have just sort of drifted off. And usually that's what you're going to see. But you can obviously get it for Marfan's trauma and so on. And uh, monocular diplopia, we sort of talked about. Another one where you sort of see uh, your uh, zonules just sort of sitting there reaching out to the lens that they just dropped. And here on CT, 
because the lens is just sort of sitting back in the back of the eye as opposed to over the front. Um, with these, usually they don't recommend dilating it just because the structures that are injured are usually sort of up here. So if you suspect this injury, um, try not to dilate the eye to look into the back of the eye um, and you let uh, opto come. But like I said, man, if you just sort of make that diagnosis before they get there, it's kind of cool. And here is, a, like I said, this is just an artificial lens that had sort of fallen away. You can see a sort of a loosening of the uh, connective uh, sort of iris and zonules up here. And this guy is just sort of sitting in the back. It was also a very nice kind of like uh, deflation of the anterior chamber. Sort of gives you this little like sort of uh, saddle back kind of look to it. No, guys, come on, we're in the Bronx. This was Ayer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we're awake but not happy about it. Okay, good. So optic nerve sheath measurement. This is the one we sort of do this uh, a lot of, okay? Um, so the optic nerve attaches to the globe posteriorly. It's contiguous with the dura mater, so the subarachnoid fluid sort of flows through there. Um, and that's uh, the arachnoid, sorry, one more time. And the arachnoid space is sort of what we're looking at uh, at that time, and so there is an established uh, there is an established relationship between uh, optic nerve sheath diameter and intracranial uh, pressure. So um, we're measuring back through here. We'll get a better look at it. And we're sort of looking at the shadow of the sheath um, from side to side here, and you're usually wanting to get sort of a midline uh, transverse. You can, you can go ahead and do longitudinal as well. It should be about the same. Obviously, uh, but um, but it's uh, traditionally sort of the transverse view. Um, the uh, idea about this is kind of like beelines in CHF, um, is that the changes that you're going to see on ultrasound will sort of uh, uh, lead your other modalities uh, by several hours. So your beelines sort of come and go with ultrasound relatively quickly, whereas it takes a while for them to come and go on chest X-ray, uh, fluid on chest X-ray. Um, same thing here, papilledema in the back of the eye uh, is actually uh, delayed somewhat because it's sort of this pushing forward and a little bit of, uh, 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 you get a little bit of, uh, of uh, power potentially to the optic nerve uh, uh, disc. Um, and that, those sort of changes on fundoscopy uh, uh, are preceded by the changes in your optic nerve sheet band. So the optic nerve Dilation happens. It's also going to increase intraocular pressure. Awesome. Uh, yeah. As a manifestation of the increased ICP, we have intraocular pressure. So usually not ocular pressure, but it's intracranial pressure because the, the compartment of the eye um, would be separate. We're actually looking behind the retina, in the sort of uh, so outside the globe to where the uh, the optic nerve is. So it's sort of like looking at the, um, the connection to the uh, CSF is, is what we're looking at there. Um, for intraocular pressure, I don't think there's a relationship between the optic nerve disc with the, the uh, disc there and what you see on ultrasound. So what you're saying here then is that you would expect to see a dilated optic nerve sheath on ultrasound before you would see, see any fundoscopic Correct. findings. Um, yeah. So, so traditionally, we send an intern out to make sure the fire is not real. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Sweet. At ABP, I had a fire drill. Like, I feel like I'm back at Jacoby. Um, okay. So in any event, um, there's a little bit of controversy about sort of what your uh, cutoff is, but it's the same issue with diabetes, right? If you said that 150 uh, on a fasting glucose is diabetes, then like you're going to catch a lot more diabetics, but you're also going to catch some people who are not diabetic and just happen to be over 150. So it's sort of that that sort of moving um, moving range of sort of like where my cutoffs are for sensitivity and specificity. So same thing here. When I sort of first was doing uh, ultrasound, actually as a resident, it was like, yeah, greater than 
greater than five is a, is, is a problem. That's, that's increased ICP. And then more stuff comes out. It's like, okay, well, greater than 5.2. You know, okay, more stuff comes out. You know, greater than 5.8 is definitely, and it's sort of like people uh, kind of uh, are continuing to change their goalposts. It's like uh, William Olsler said, um, when a new uh, treatment comes out, be sure to use it as much as you can while it still works. <laughs> because in a couple years, they're going to find out not so much. So uh, uh, the same thing here. You measure the optic nerve sheath about three millimeters back from where it enters the retina. So that's what this one is for. And then you sort of measure across to the extremes of the shadow of your optic nerve sheath. Um, uh, you take a couple measurements and average it, just like a tono pen or if it's calibrated uh, or anything else like that. And you sort of get that value. Um, on average, uh, greater than five millimeters is considered abnormal. Um, and you might think about increased intracranial pressure. We'll take a look at uh, uh, an interesting uh, correlation graph here in just a second about that. But this is again sort of going back to what we think we're measuring, coming back here and just sort of measuring across here. Okay, same idea. And so opinion sort of varies. Um, long story short, if someone comes in and you're worried about uh, you know, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you're worried about ICP for other reasons, and their optic nerve sheath diameter bilaterally is less than five millimeters, you might think about a different diagnosis. And uh, actually, to uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mazin's point, um, you might potentially, because of decreased uh, venous uh, flow out of the, uh, of the head, you, you might even see conditions uh, like uh, venous, uh, dural venous thrombosis that increase a little bit of ICP, so you're sort of seeing large ones here. That's not been worked out, but you can imagine a situation where that should work out. And if you guys want a senior project, collect all of your central dural venous uh, thrombosis cases and do optic nerve sheath diameters on them. Um, yeah. It's a four-year program. What? Okay, so uh, so here, and then so if you're less than five, it's probably look somewhere else. Um, but if it's greater than sort of 5.2 to 5.8, then that's when we're starting to get excited about increased uh, intracranial pressure. Um, when you look at a lot of these sort of studies that have gone back to validate some of these numbers, they're just like, everyone is between, you know, 5 and 5.6, like, or 4.8 and 5.6. So, you know, meh. And so that's why you, uh, you take it with a grain of salt, but set your sort of goal marks um, where you start to care. Where do I start to care? Let's say I start to care where I might start to treat ICP. And then so most of my guys here, you know, into the 5 point range. Okay. And I think I will start to finish up because uh, other folks are going to be talking. You can also see, uh, you can actually see papilledema on a transverse cut where you sort of get what's called this crescent sign where your optic uh, uh, nerve sort of protrudes into the globe itself. Sort of like, whoink. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of what pap papilledema looks like. And again, increased ICP. It's just uh, wide and you're looking at your sort of numbers down here try to determine, okay, I'm going to put this in context with the patient and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, for uh, extra credit, this will be 20 points. Uh, what might this false positive be in the back of the eye? It looks sort of bright and on your fundoscope looks like a cholesterol in the line. I remember? It's the Germans. Okay. So that's a drusen, so optic nerve head drusen. Okay. Oh, yeah, that. So essentially, <laughs> you can see this. They may not have inject, you know, sh shoved uh, a pin into their eye. It's entirely possible that there's just a, a little juice in there. Okay, and this is your last uh, extra credit uh, eye pun. It's uh, Martinez, myself, Chertov. Anyone? So this is your eye candy. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, I can end it there. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>